Welcome to online worship here at Crossroads this morning. My name is Kristen Brown. I'm the director of youth ministries here at Crossroads. We're thankful we have this opportunity to gather virtually. And although we really miss gathering with you on Sunday mornings, we're grateful that we can gather in this manner. We're, this is a great reminder that church is not just a building too. And we have found technology to be a huge blessing during this time. I want to remind you that today is the first Sunday of the month, and so that means it's Prayer Force Sunday. And normally we'd have our leaders and their students meet after the church service, but obviously we can't do that this week. So I just want to encourage you all um, as leaders to reach out to your partners today, whether it be uh, via email, text, or um, a phone call. I just want to encourage you to reach out to them and pray with them or ask how you can pray for them. I've had some encouraging feedback from some of our leaders having pen pal type interactions with their partners, and it's a blessing to know that this is happening. I believe human connection is so vital during times of isolation like this, and I feel it's important to keep making these connections with our youth. Hear this call to worship from Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray together this morning. Lord our God, we trust your promise to be among us as we gather, even in the midst of our gathering in unconventional ways. We come in the name of Christ, drawn by your spirit, eager to hear your word. Fill our hearts with your spirit and prepare us for faithful service. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please join Graham as he leads us in a time of worship together this morning? Die. 
steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I call on the Lord. The Lord answers me and sets me free. The Lord is my strength and my song. 
he has become my salvation. Therefore I shall not die, but shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. In Christ, God answers us and sets us free. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Graham. Uh, my name is Andy Seaton, if we have not met, and I am the Young Life College Director at Cal State San Marcos. Um, and in these crazy times, I just wanted to come and say hello and thank you and just share with you some of the incredible things that are happening uh, with students still in the midst of everything going on in our world. Um, if you are anything like me, I have woken up most mornings over the last three weeks confused and disoriented, um, hoping that maybe this is going to be ending soon, looking for good news, um, and then come face to face with what's happening. About three weeks ago, our students were asked to leave campus. Um, they were told that the rest of their semester would be finished online. Teachers would be moving to an online platform. So most of the students that we know through Young Life College were actually moved home within 24 hours of finding out that school was gonna look different for the rest of the year. I mean, in the midst of so many things being canceled or being postponed or put off, we um, have over and over again said that young life is not canceled, community is not canceled, and the hope that Jesus provides is not canceled. Obviously, things are going to look a little bit different. That community night that I was so excited to share with you guys that would have been happening at the end of April is not going to be happening the way that we had originally hoped it would be. If you guys could be praying for ways that we will navigate how to invite people actively to be a part of Young Life College in the community, and then we had projected about $20,000 to be raised out of that. So I'd so appreciate your prayers and how to navigate that. And in the midst of what, like I said, things being canceled, Young Life and community and the hope of Jesus is not. We've been able to reach students in a way I never thought we would through social media, different chat rooms, online, and um, even through a Netflix party app where we get to watch Netflix all over the country together and talk about it and laugh, we have been building relationships. Even last night, I was able to sit with a student, my Bible in hand, hers in her hand, and she got to hear the gospel for her for the first time. So I want to encourage you, please keep praying for me. I am so grateful and I hope you hear this. I'm so grateful that you guys are here as a part of my family um, in the midst of this craziness. Thank you for praying. And I can't wait to share with you more about what's happening with Young Life College and how we can continue to encourage students, even though they're not physically with us, that we can remain connected, that while we're spatially distancing, we're not socially distancing, that we can still be united as the body of Christ. So thank you. Good morning, Crossroads. I have the privilege uh, and honor of delivering the prayer for God's people this morning. But before I do that, I'd like to read a poem that I think is uh, very apropos for the times that we're in, as well as for this morning. And thanks to uh, Chuck Jasa, uh, he sent this poem to all of our life group. And so I'd like to share it with you. It's written by Annie Johnson Flint, and she writes, he gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sends more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he adds his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. We find in Philippians 4, 6, these words, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, 
With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Would you pray with me? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to come to you, uh, both corporately and individually, as we bring to you the things that are on our heart. And thank you for hearing us. Thank you for answering our prayers. And we ask these things, Lord, uh, regarding the comfort and the healing of the sick. Uh, in particular, <clears throat> Marilyn Faber's grandson, William DeLong, DeJean, and uh, his family as he recovers from the terrible accident that he incurred uh, a week ago or so with the crushing of his legs. Please bless the family. Please bless his wife, Renee, and his children, and give doctors real wisdom to help heal him and bring him back to the uh, ability to walk. Lord, we thank you also for answered prayer for Carol Beasel, and we ask for continued prayer for her complete recovery from the stroke that she suffered. And then, Lord, we have real concerns and in some cases fear regarding this COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing. We ask that you'd give us stamina, that you'd give those healthcare workers that are working such long hours the ability to continue to help heal. We pray for the insight and uh, for the researchers and scientists as they seek a treatment and a cure for this virus. Lord, guide them and give them wisdom, give them discernment as they seek these things. Pray also for discernment for our government leaders as they consider policies that will help protect us. Lord, there are new things happening within our families because of this virus. And so we ask for self-discipline and perseverance for our students as they study online. And also we ask for patience for families in tight quarters, certainly new things for us. But I pray that they would also, each of us in our families would see new opportunities to share with each other. And we ask that you'd help us to make good use of our time together at home. Lord, we pray for the security uh, of the increasing number of unemployed in particular, we ask that you would bless Jackie's son, Jason, who recently was furloughed from his job with three children. Give them provision, Lord. Give them the sense of security and peace. And bless Jane, his wife, and the children. Lord, we pray for peace. Um, for those about the well-being of friends and family, uh, that have concerns about the well-being of their friends and family. Uh, Diane uh, brought to our attention a friend of her daughter's, uh, Diane Jasa, a friend of her daughter's uh, name is Mario. And so we bring him before you and the others that are on the ship that he's on, the Theodore Roosevelt carrier in Guam with this spreading virus and so many other things like that. Give us your peace and your assurance and help us not to fear as you've asked us to do, but to trust in you for everything. We pray for shelter for the homeless during these dangerous times. We ask for wisdom and guidance for our spiritual leaders. Andy Seaton will be with us this morning and we ask that you'd bless her ministry with the young life on the San Marcos uh, campus that we'd soon be able to get back together in fellowship and in uh, instructing these students that need you so badly. And we pray for this ministry that it would be successful. Lord, we also pray for our ministry here at Crossroads, for our council, our search team, and our staff. We ask your blessing this morning on our prayer partners, both young and old, and even though we're separate, I pray that we'd be in prayer for each other, not only this morning, but throughout these weeks and in months possibly that we will be separated. 
And then finally, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from Pastor Ryan Hall. We ask your blessing on him and his wife, Claire, as they seek your guidance in their ministry. Please use them this morning to deliver your message to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And in his name, we ask these things. Amen. Now, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that uh, we're going to hear from Pastor Ryan, and we welcome him uh, to our pulpit that's far away. Thanks for coming through videotape, Ryan. Greetings, and the Lord be with you, Crossroads. My name is Ryan Hall. I am seated here in Pillar Church's Sanctuary in downtown Holland, Michigan. Uh, it is a joy to be able to connect with you uh, digitally and from afar. My wife Claire and I are certainly disappointed that we weren't able to join you in person, um, but we are thankful to be able to connect with you this way. I have family. I was raised on the Central Coast in the Monterey Peninsula, and I have a lot of family still there. And I've been able to communicate with them and just know how hard it has been to have the governor's uh, stay in place order and just know that the prayers of myself, the prayers of my wife Claire, both of us are praying for you and are praying with you um, as we go through these uncertain and tumultuous times together. There's a couple photos that I want to be able to show you of myself and of Claire as we're not able to be there with you in person. She liked the one where we both were dressed up nicely and we had the uh, Christmas tree in the background and we were all uh, done up. And I much preferred the one where we're much more comfortable, laid back at the beach. And that's actually in La Jolla because I was able to serve at a church in North Park, San Diego, right in the center city for a few months this summer. My wife and I met at the University of Michigan, which is where we did our undergraduate work. And we actually met through Young Life and Young Life College more specifically. It has been really cool to hear just um, about the relationship that Crossroads has been able to develop and establish with Young Life at uh, Cal State San Marcos. Uh, I served on Young Life staff uh, for a year after I graduated college. Young Life is an incredible ministry, and I wouldn't have met the love of my life if it wasn't for it. And I certainly, especially during the early years of my walk with Christ, wouldn't have become who I am without it. I understand and am mindful of the fact that words like unprecedented, uncertain, unsure are commonplace in our everyday vocabulary, in the news headlines, on social media. People are scared. People are anxious. People are nervous about what this means. Uncertain about how long we'll have to stay in isolation. Afraid of being alone, hearing about the lack of medical supplies, it, it all is unprecedented. And yet we still gather and we still worship. And on this day, if you're watching on Sunday, we gather to worship Palm Sunday, a very specific day, a very important day in the liturgical calendar of the Christian church around the world. And yet we are still in the season of Lent. And the season of Lent feels just about right for where we are because we are mourning. We're mourning the loss of jobs. We're mourning the loss of income. We're mourning the loss of investments and the loss of future plans, retirement plans. Certainly, all of us are mourning a sense of normalcy. Our lives have been totally and completely disrupted by this pandemic. 
And yet, we gather in living rooms, maybe with our pajamas still on, to turn on the TV, to go to YouTube, and to find a video to worship together. We still gather. And even if we can't see one another in person, even if we're not filling pews, we're still connected. We're still connected in the name of Jesus. And we are still connected around the world and in our local churches at Crossroads via worshiping the risen Savior. And so, if you're watching this on April 5th, then happy Palm Sunday to you. Uh, In the liturgical calendar of the Christian church, Palm Sunday always precedes Easter. It's the last Sunday in the season of Lent, and it marks the beginning of Holy Week. If you are a regular at church, then you probably remember a time when you've shown up, and as you've walked into the sanctuary, perhaps you've been handed a palm branch Uh, and you're not really sure what to do with it, maybe. You're not really sure what it signifies. And maybe you've heard a sermon about Jesus, and there's something about a donkey, and he's riding into Jerusalem, and the preacher has told you that that's really significant. And maybe you've stumbled upon this YouTube video, and you're not a regular at church, and if that's the case... I want you to know just how glad and grateful I am that you are watching this video. And you're hearing this talk of Palm Sunday and you have really no idea what's going on. And if that's the case, I want you to know that you're not alone. Because I'm sure that many of us who are regular churchgoers who claim to be Christians, call ourselves Christians, are still a little uncertain about what Palm Sunday is really means. So, together, let's dive into what Palm Sunday is all about and why it is so appropriate to celebrate Palm Sunday in the midst of everything that we're going through right now. So if you have a Bible near you uh, or a phone and you can look up a scripture app or go online, I invite you to find Mark 11, the book of Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. If you don't have a Bible or a phone with you, uh, I invite you to listen attentively and to listen well as I read. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say to them, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. Now, Jesus and his disciples are coming from Jericho, which is about 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem, and we're told uh, that they have come near Bethany. Now, Bethany is this little town that's about two miles away 
from Jerusalem, just kind of a stone's throw away. And we're told in Scripture that Bethany was a town that was home to Martha, it was home to Mary, Lazarus, and John. These names, these figures who play such a pivotal role in the Gospels. Jesus tells two of his disciples to go get him a colt that has never been ridden and to bring that colt to him. Now, reading the minds of the disciples, Jesus tells them in verse three, he says, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. Now, the Greek word uh, for colt here is polon, which means the colt of a donkey or the colt of a horse. And we're told in the Gospel of Matthew, one of the other four accounts of Jesus' life, that it is indeed a donkey, so we can know that for sure. And not only does Jesus desire to ride on a donkey as he enters into the city of Jerusalem, the, the most significant place in the entire Jewish religion, but he wants to ride on a donkey that has never been ridden before. It's kind of like if you were picking up a date for the very first time, if you were taking out a really important client to dinner, if you were picking up your in-laws maybe from the airport for the very first time and you're driving your car, and you wanna make a really good first impression. The only problem is that the car that you're driving, you just got, and it's actually a manual transmission, and you've never actually learned how to drive stick very well, and so you finally arrive to where you need to get, you pick up your date, you pick up that important client, you pick up your in-laws from the airport, and wanting to make a good impression, you've gotten the car cleaned, you've vacuumed the inside. Except, as you begin to drive to where you need to go, you're trying to get it into gear, you're not really sure what to do with the clutch. How do you do the clutch with the accelerator? You're throwing it into second when it needs to be in fourth. The gears are grinding, they're making a bunch of noise. The car is bucking back and forth. Your, people's heads are being thrown into the seat behind them. And the engine is stalling, and it's not really making a very good first impression at all. This is sort of what we can imagine when Jesus gets onto an unridden donkey. A donkey who is utterly confused bamboozled, in fact, by the fact that he has somebody on his back for the very first time. Imagine Jesus trying to control it, but the donkey is making a ton of noise, making an absolute racket. It's running into families that are walking down the street. Kids are screaming in fear. Merchants are yelling because the donkey's knocking stuff over. Not exactly a great first impression. And yet, even amidst all of that, something truly remarkable happens. This is in verses 7 to 8. Let me read them for you. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Listen to this. It says, Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields spread their cloaks on the dirty, dusty, rocky road. N.T. Wright tells us that this road would have been full of dust, very uh, unfrequently, infrequently rains in the Middle East. And so the folks who are throwing their cloaks down onto this road, their clothes would have been destroyed. Particularly as a donkey treads over them, its hooves creating holes and tears within their cloaks. Similarly, the people spread leafy branches on the ground, the leafy branches that they had acquired after working long and hard in the fields. Why 
would they do this? Why would they throw their hard work down the drain? Friends, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, the seat of power for all of Israel, on a donkey on purpose. The Old Testament prophesies of a king coming. Zechariah 9.9 says this, lowly and riding on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey, prophesy the coming of the true king. Friends, Palm Sunday is so important because it is Jesus finally declaring to the world, I am the king you have been waiting for. I am the king you have heard about. I am the king who has been written about. I am your king. Jesus says, I am the true king. Because only a king would be so bold as to ride into Jerusalem on the back of a horse or the back of a donkey, for that matter. And everyone in this particular context would have understood exactly what Jesus was pointing to and what Jesus was declaring. And yet Jesus does not do this in a way that is boastful, He does not do this in a way that is regal, in a way that is even really very smooth. Certainly, it certainly doesn't appear to be kingly the way that Jesus is entering into Jerusalem because Jesus announces his kingship in an unexpected way. And as he announced his kingship in an unexpected way then, still today he announces his kingship unexpectedly to us. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic that has not only come to dominate our news headlines, but has also come to dominate nearly every inch of our lives, Jesus is still king. Amidst it all, amidst the confusion, amidst the uncertainty, Jesus still reigns. He is still somehow, even when it doesn't seem like a king. Former prime minister of the Netherlands and famous reformed theologian, significant reformed theologian, Abraham Kuyper, he put it this way. He said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Let me read that again. He says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Jesus will prove his lordship, his reign over all creation when he defeats sin in the resurrection on a moment that we celebrate on Easter. And in his defeat over sin, Jesus proves that he is king over even death itself. And the people in Mark, the people that we're reading about, recognize this. Verses 9 to 10 say this, Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is a war cry. The people are chanting Jesus' name and we can feel the excitement. We can feel the anticipation. This is what they've been waiting for. This is what has been prophesied. And it's finally coming to fruition. They scream with adrenaline, Hosanna! And yet... Hosanna is indeed a war cry. 
But it's also a cry for help. It is also a cry for help. Hosanna is a Greek word, but it's a Greek word that is based on two Hebrew words. It is based on the word yasha, which means save or deliver. And it is based on the word ana, which means please. Save or deliver and please. Hosanna, please save us. Lord, please save us. Hosanna. If you are a believer in Jesus, and even if you're not, I I wonder if you can relate to this tension between a war cry and a cry for, for help, a plea for help. On one hand, saying, Hosanna! God is sovereign. Jesus is king. He is king over this pandemic. He is king over COVID-19. He is king over my job. He is king over my health. He is king over my family, and he is king over this situation. We might be saying to ourselves, we might be saying to ourselves right now, God must have a purpose for this. Perhaps you're able to see the glass half full, and you say, this is wonderful. I get to spend time with my children. I get to catch up on some much-needed rest. I get to connect with my spouse And you're saying, God must be up to something in this. God is the king, so nothing happens without him allowing it to. He's got to have a purpose for this too, right? Hosanna. And on the other hand, maybe you're crying, Hosanna. God, please help us. Hosanna. Maybe you're praying, help us with this pandemic. Help me with my job. Help me with my income. Help me with my health. I'm so afraid of getting sick. Help me with my children who might not be able to finish out the last few months of their academic year. Help me with my retirement. Help me with the depression that is beginning to sink in. Help me, Lord, with the loneliness that I'm feeling that I can't shake and I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel for it. King Jesus, please help us. Please save us. Hosanna. And so, as we social distance, as we isolate ourselves from one another, as I am preaching on a stool and not behind a pulpit, as we sing happy birthday two times through, washing our hands for the umpteenth time that day, we are called to live into this tension, this Palm Sunday tension of what Hosanna really means. Because we do and we should find confidence in the fact that Jesus is king over all. He rides in on a donkey into Jerusalem and not a stallion, and not a horse, signifying even further that he is the king of peace and not of war. And rest assured, friends, that he is king over this pandemic, that he is king over all that is happening, that he is king over the fear, that he is king over the uncertainty, that he is king over these unprecedented times. The church has been through epidemics, it's been through martyrdom, it's been through war, it's been through persecution, and God has proven time and time again that nothing on this planet, no matter how hard we might try, 
can defeat him and can defeat his global church. This is our Hosanna war cry. This is a confidence that Jesus Christ was God who came to earth in human flesh, was fully God and was fully human, did not sin, and took our place on the cross, taking our sins upon himself, defeating death and sin in the process, so that we could be restored into right relationship with God. If you cry Hosanna on this Palm Sunday, and you say it passionately, and you say it with confidence, boldly crying it, knowing and believing that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is king over all. And if you find yourself crying out Hosanna, but maybe not with as much confidence, maybe with a lot of fear, maybe with a lot of doubt, and it actually comes out Hosanna as a whimper. You're saying to yourself, Jesus, please save us, and you find yourself praying more now than you can remember. Know that God hears you. If you're scared, if you're anxious, if the uncertainty has left you in a panic and you're uncertain about what to do, I encourage you to cry, literally cry with tears in your eyes. Hosanna, please save us. Hosanna, please help us. Please, Lord, you are the king and I need you. We need you. Hosanna. Friends, the quiet confidence, the quiet confidence of the Christian faith is that Christ is king. But he's not king in a way that we might expect. See, he announces his reign humbly and without fanfare. He announces his kingly love for us by humbly riding into Jerusalem on a donkey that has never even been ridden. And amidst our mangled cries of confidence with our pleas for help, Christ models how we are to approach this moment on this Palm Sunday. He reminds us to be patient. He reminds us to approach this situation humbly and to trust that the true king reigns supremely and sovereignly in unexpected ways. As we wrap up this morning, I am mindful of a practice that we have been doing here at Pillar Church throughout our staff meetings that we've been having over Zoom, throughout our devotional time together, throughout praying for our church, praying for our community, and praying for our world. We have been reflecting on and meditating on Psalm 62. And I want to end this morning leaving you in a Hosanna tension, knowing that Christ is king and yet crying out for help with the first two verses of Psalm 62. They say, truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We want to thank you, Ryan, for your message and the assurance that we have nothing to fear during this time as we put our faith in Christ the King. We celebrate his triumphal entry, uh, but we know he's still on the throne today and he's in control. We pray the Holy Spirit would uh, light a fire in us, in the church, that the church would grow during this time, as we've seen, uh, as we've seen throughout history. We pray, uh, pray that you were blessed by the Word of God, and we ask you to join us as we sing Build Your Kingdom Here, and it talks very much about that, about uh, that fire um, to grow His church through us today. Uh-huh.
It's a place with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come and you made us now Are the church We need your power in us We seek Thank you for joining us for our online service. We hope you have a blessed week. And now we have the parting blessing by Ryan Hall. Friends, this Palm Sunday, live into the Hosanna tension of our current moment and cry it out knowing that Christ is Lord over all, that he is our true king. And also cry it, begging him for help, begging him to intervene in some way, shape, or form in your life and in our community. And cry Hosanna knowing that God is with you and that he loves you. So now go with this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.